bleed green? Are you an ultimate Eagles football fan? Well, you're in the right place. Well, you're in the right place. This is Birds 365, hosted by the new Mac and Mac, Jody McDonald and John McMullen. And here we go, here we go! Who collectively have covered and talked about more than 50 plus years of Eagles football. Kick off your day with Birds 365. You'll get debate. We love to argue. You'll get the real story from inside the locker room. And you'll hear from some of the great football minds from around the region. You're about to become an Eagles insider. Get in the game. Join Jody Mack and Johnny Mack. And join the football community that flocks to Birds 365. Birds 365 starts right now. Welcome to the NFL. Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! And a good morning, Eagle Nation. It is a countdown Thursday. We are counting down to first legalized tampering and then free agency in the National Football League. A pretty big week uh, leading into for the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, Today is show number 480, J-Mac. We only got 20 shows to go before we hit our 500. Yeah, I, I thought I'm, I'm, I, I must have lost. I must have been dreaming. I thought we hit 500 a while. No. I don't know what's going on. Uh, I don't know why I thought we took a week was... off, which might have, I had to go back and change my calendar because I put them out like a month in advance. I had to cross them out and go, all right, because I didn't, we didn't know we were going to have a week off. But no, today's show number 480. Right. Which means, yeah, 500 is in the offing. That's pretty damn good, if you ask me. And today should be a good show because, I don't know about you, how you feeling today, John? Uh, I'm feeling fine. Not okay. great, not bad. I'm, it's just a normal day, I would uh, say. The, the reason why I'm feeling good today is I went to bed last night before 11 o'clock. I can't tell nice. you the last time I went to bed. So you weren't on until 2 in the morning. That's, I was not on the good. air till 2 o'clock in the morning. Villanova won their Big East tournament game. There wasn't late night Sixer basketball to watch. AEW is already over and done with. My guy, uh, Orange. Orange uh, Cassidy opened the show and I turned it the off. the show with a major oh, win. I think Tony is, is, is trolling me. I think Tony Khan is trolling me. Because he I knows he... I do not like Orange Cassidy. And if he starts the show, Jody, I turn it off. I'm not even joking. I turn it I, off. I believe you, but I'm just telling you, you are misguided. Orange, oh, Orange puts on a great show every time he performs. And oh, by the way, he brings the house down. They love him. Now, I think Tony is directly uh, telling his broadcast, you got to help put Orange over because they talk him up. Yeah, he's very street. close. He's very close to him. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we got to do our wrestling show with WrestleMania is going to be in Philadelphia next year, not this yeah. year, not the upcoming well, one. So hopefully we're next still doing it around show number 800 by that time. So yeah. That- yeah. So hopefully we, we do a couple wrestling shows thrown in there because I can get some good guests from WWE, but um, it, it, he's not doing it. He's not doing it. He's not doing a service to his company. There are guys who can get over and guys got, you know, you can sell t-shirts and blah, blah, blah. And the fans like him. Santino Morella was the same way in W. I, but he's a goofball. He's not going anywhere. When you're a goofball, nobody's going to take you seriously. Oh, he, he seriously won like 10 straight title defenses, which uh, you want to get on Tony Khan. You get on his case. He, he gives the belt to uh, Wardlow and then turns around and takes it back from him. First of all, everybody's got a belt. That's another problem. We're uh, we're on the tank. Everybody in the damn company's got a belt. It's meaningless. They got they got a couple extra belts. I'll give you that. And oh, by the way, Tony did a promo that included Orange Cassidy last night. Yeah, don't do he, promos. Don't he me. needs to stick to just making the yeah. decisions. He 
botched it something pitiful. And I guess he did it live because they just let it go. The he he misidentified uh, the All Atlantic Championship. He called it the International Championship. It, it was. Well, not I think good. they're renaming it, but he didn't make it clear. Yeah, that's not. Yeah, he's not good. That I, I think they're renaming the championship because it was such a a goofball name. Again, everything about the guy is goofball. Nobody cares about the damn title. So they're renaming it, but he didn't get it across, evidently. I, now, I, I had no idea it. what the hell he was talking about. Yeah. So uh, I like, I'm an Orange Cassidy fan, but uh, Tony did not handle it the best. Hey, we got we got to talk about the Philadelphia Eagles. <laughs> McMullen and McDonald getting off on a wrestling tangent. I apologize for that. But see, I was so well rested. I yeah. had been we can burning the that. candle at both ends the last couple of days. I think I got a cold. I said, idiot, get to bed. So I, I was in bed last night by 1045. So I got a full night's sleep. I'm ready to rock and roll with you here today, McMullen, and talk Eagle free agency. They can be negotiating right now with any of the Eagle free agents. That We haven't reached the uh, legalized tampering stage yet when all other teams can talk to players. Howie Roseman can be constantly on the phone with any of the many free agents Eagles have, agents, and maybe some Eagle players. Maybe some guys who are locked in, signed here. Do you think there is any lobbying going on? Do you think teammates are attempting to talk other teammates into coming back? Uh, when we had the little uh, social media incident last night, which you and I saw differently about Chauncey Gardner-Johnson putting out the uh, Love Philadelphia tweet. Um, social media actually calling guys. Do you think other Eagles are attempting to recruit their teammates who are, who were who were their teammates may yet be their teammates, but are free agents and you offering within the next couple of days? I don't think there's any active lobbying. Somebody might pick up their phone and fire off a tweet. You kind of see that every once in a while. Like, come play here. Come play. Slay does that a lot. Um, you know, with, with Chauncey, I forgot who did it. You know, I think it might have been Slay. Um, said, you got to take care of your family, whatever. So, I mean, most guys realize just that it's a business and if you get a better deal somebody else you got to take somewhere else you got to take it for your family and and yourself so most guys are understanding of that the business aspect because they learn it from both sides i mean you know when they're when the salary cap number is too big they know what's coming so you know there is no loyalty generally in this business maybe with howie a little bit with some of the veteran players he he falls in love with but um, I think for the most part, not over the top lobbying, like, please come back, take less money to come back, things like that. I, I, that kind of stuff doesn't, doesn't really happen. Right. Because chances are, they know at some point they're going to become a free agent. They don't want to have the, the pressure put on them. Oh, come back, to, take a couple dollars less. Blah, blah, blah. It doesn't, uh, if, if you're going to go down that road, you can't expect someone else to go down that road with you thereafter if you become a free agent, which uh, uh, hometown discount, by the way. Um, Howard Askin, my compatriot from WIP, said... Yeah, um, we got to get Howard on the show. We haven't had Howard in a while. We're due to have Howard on for sure. And he has been good enough to come on with us before, so we'll we'll give that a shot in the upcoming weeks. Because uh, Howard is A, connected, and gets good information. But from time to time, I think he sees things through eagle-colored glasses, well, he um, works for the team. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Howard said on WIP either yesterday or the day before that he sees Brandon Graham coming back on a two-year proximity of $12 million deal, which is not outrageous money. That's uh, that's pretty much going rate. I don't know that I would call that a hometown discount, but you never know. It only takes one for somebody to uh, evaluate that you could make a big difference on their team and raise the bar. So I wouldn't call that an outrageous deal for Brandon Graham. That would be a fair deal in my eyes. And he also said he thinks Fletcher Cox will be back on a one-year deal in the neighborhood of $4 million. Oh, now, wow, wow. I, I, think I, we, I, I was with him right up until $4 million. I, I think he might be back on a one-year deal. $4 million? I, I uh, that was that was Howard's take, Howard's number, and hey, I I have uh, been critical of Fletcher Cox this year 
in comparison to the contract that he signed. Not that he was a bad player. He was a fine player. He's not the dominant player that he used to be, but he did a nice job in the middle of the Eagles defensive line. He got more sacks this year than he did last year. The whole Eagle line did. Uh, so you knew the numbers were going up and that they all play off each other. They get and push up the middle from Fletcher and from Hargrave, which makes it easier for guys on the end because of the guys on the end getting in as quickly as they do. They push it into the middle and Fletcher and Hargrave can get sacked. So one hand helps the other. So Fletcher had a good solid year. And if you look at his uh, production this year as compared to the previous year where he was paid $14 million, you would say, well, we should get like $16 million because he's better in 2022 than he was in 2021. $4 million for Fletcher Cox? I, I've basically written Fletcher off and said he's going to be elsewhere. I don't see him coming back. But at $4 million, you'd have to give him that, right, John? Well, that'd be a downright good deal. You know, that would be, you should bring him back if you can get him for $4 million. Um, you now, part of it is, you know, the Eagles overpaid him last year. I think there's, he's not getting 14 anywhere. Um, so he is coming down a little bit um, in, you know, maybe how he got a little bit too caught up in some of that, what we talk about. He's a little bit too loyal to some of the veteran players at that, which he's admitted, by the way, he's admitted. Um, he paid him too much last year, but he had a good season. He was a solid player, as you mentioned. I think it's more difficult here because he used to be such a great player. Like if you've just placed him down somewhere else and he had that season, you'd say, yeah, pretty good. Good job. Pretty good part of the rotation, but he's not the player he once was. Obviously he's a $4 million player. Uh, if you can get him for four million dollars, that'd be that'd be a downright good deal. Yeah, I I don't agree with that number. So the question is, I think he might be back because I think they might be losing Javon. So I think he might be back on a one year deal. The question is, you know, how high do you have to go? Um, obviously, and and where are you going to place that demarcation line? I. If it's four million, it's a no-brainer. Bring right. him back. Uh, and this again, per our bud Howard Eskin. Not sure if you hit that nail on the head, but we'll find out. Uh, here's my question to you: If uh, you just mentioned you think Javon Hargrave's got a chance to get the big payday, one of the higher-paid defensive linemen in free agency this year, if Howie Roseman is believing that could be the case too, that Javon is going to get an offer that is going to take them out of the ballpark. Do you work harder to get Fletcher done maybe before free agency even starts to know you got one of the two? Because if I'm Fletcher Cox's agent and Javon Hargrave signs a uh, three year, $62 million deal with another team on Wednesday, first day of free agency, whatever I was thinking I could get for Fletcher, I, I'm going to tack a couple of million on top of it because now the Eagles don't have that lever. They need Fletcher Cox that much more if Javon Hargrave walks out the door. How is Howie using that balancing act on the Yeah, team? I think he's tried in, in that instance because he's got this information, right? Like one of the things Schefter was on uh, with uh, one of your competitors on, on, on the Fanatic, uh, John Kincaid, yesterday, um, and he was giving out $20 million for Hargrave. He was giving out, I think he put 13 14 on on Chauncey, I I don't think he gave a number on Bradbury, but everybody kind of knows Bradbury's leaving. So his assessment was he was going to, the Eagles were going to lose all three players and nobody's more plugged in than Adam when it comes to contract numbers. So I got to believe it's going to be close. He's going to be close when he throws out numbers. Um, And yeah, how he knows that Adam knows it, how he knows it. So, um, he he understands the landscape, and if Javon Hargrave, and I wrote this on Sports Illustrated, if he gets twenty million, he's gone. You know, he's gone. Um, and if how he knows it's coming, yeah, he's gonna be more focused on on trying to get Fletcher back for one year deal, hopefully for four million. But I don't think so. Uh, optimistic number from our our buddy Howard Howard Askin. Um, there was a kid on the Patriots, uh, Ferentz, backup offensive lineman, signed yesterday, re-signed with the Patriots. 
made it to free agency, but signed before we ever got there. Usually you get within a couple of days. You say, yeah, I, I'm taking this to the open market. Let the open market decide how much I'm worth. Cause I think I'll just take a general guesstimate here, About 95% of the time it goes up rather than comes back down. You just all oh, get to the market. You had a cocky guy every once in a while go, you let the open market decide. Then you find out the open market says, you're not as good as you think, pal. Most times it is uh, <laughs> as good as you think, if not more so. But this uh, key uh, backup lineman for the Patriots resigned. Any chance how he gets any of the free agents signed before legal tampering on Sunday? Sure. I think, you know, the Zach Pascals of the world, the Boston Scots of the world, uh, you know, players like that who, you know, you bring up uh, mm -hmm. Ferentz, you know, he signed a better and minimum deal, but he's, um, I, I don't know, 32, 33, he might even be 34. He's an aging player. So you mentioned, you know, he's not, CJ, you know, where you're 24, 25 ascending player there, you're going to wait and see what the market is. You, you'd like to at least. Um, with with guys like that, they kind of know. I mean, Zach Pascal's a perfect example. I, You know, if he's not getting the better in minimum, he's getting maybe a little bit more. And, you know, he gets along with Nick Sirianni, obviously. He plays an important role, even though it's not a sexy role player like that would be number one on my list to sign before free agency. You might see something like that. Same type of sense. It's just the best spot for him. And he probably knows that. It did not happen in the next 24 hours, but maybe on Birds 365 tomorrow, we have an Eagle signing to announce. And the other thing we've got no new news on, which is, I don't know, good or bad. I'll ask this both John and our first guest, John and John. Stolness joining us coming up in just a couple minutes. No coaching news. Nobody got pushed out the door, but also nobody got hired. No new Matt Patricia news. They do have some openings they need to uh, fill. And I know John is chomping at the bit to talk to the two new coordinators on uh, the offensive side and defensive side. With where we are now, it doesn't look like it's happening until after free agency starts. And then, you know, they're going to table everything. So you might not get a chance to talk to either of the two no co new coordinators for weeks, pal, uh, you, you, hoping that that was going to be the case. I don't think you got a shot right about now. Yeah, I think the Eagles take advantage of situations. Obviously, the season went far longer than expected. Well, not necessarily than expected, but than usual as you go to the Super Bowl and sure. that sort of, you know, squishes everything down. Boom, they're out in the combine. Now we got to deal with it. So, yeah. They take advantage of those types of situations. At some point, they have to put their two new co coordinators front and center, but it's not, not going to be this week, and I don't think it's going to be next. What is next here on Birds 365 is a drop-in from one of our favorite guests. You read him on Bleeding Green Nation. Uh, we'll get John Stolness. He's up next here on Birds 365. Go to get your game on. Go for the beers. Go for the cheers. Go for the hit and the hits. Go for the stakes and the stakes. Go to get your parlay on. Go to get your party on. Go for the scene. Go for the screens. Go for the gallery. Go for the win. Go to Ocean. Visit theoceanac.com to plan your visit. At Pond Lee Hockey, we've recovered billions of dollars for our clients, and we're confident we can do the same for you. With over 250 years of combined courtroom experience, we've helped over 100,000 injured clients obtain some of the largest settlements in Pennsylvania. One conversation is all it takes to help you and your family get back on track. If you've been injured in an accident, give Pond Lee Hockey a call. Hi everybody, my name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech we offer three major services. The first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Jeff 
Jeff D'Ambrosio doesn't need a special event to appreciate his customers. Jeff shows his appreciation to them every day of the year. Jeff makes sure to stock more new inventory than anyone and guarantees prices and payments that nobody can beat. There are so many reasons that thousands of customers know Jeff is the easy, friendly place to do business. More for their trades. No judgment zone for credit issues. The best, most reliable service department in the country. That's why I like Jeff, and I know you will too. Jeff will satisfy you every day. Jeff D'Ambrosio, Destination Downingtown, Owner Appreciation Event. We all know that taxes are just part of life. It's true during our working years, but also in retirement. But what you might not know is up to 85% of your Social Security benefits might be taxed. Our team at Thrive Financial has helped retire thousands of people across the Delaware Valley by asking questions they never knew they needed to ask, including how their Social Security benefits might be taxed. It's time to be proactive on taxes. Get your Thrive Retirement Tax Playbook today. Plan your day with confidence. Keep the umbrellas on hand. With action news and AccuWeather. Numerous tornadoes. Your go-to team when severe weather strikes. The water is still rising. Keeping you prepared wherever you watch. Action news and AccuWeather. The team you trust. Appreciate you streaming on in here on Birds 365 with Mac and Mac, McMullen and McDonald. We are joined by our pal from Bleeding Green Nation and the Eye on the Enemy podcast, Eagles opinion generator John Stolness, who I hope is wearing Phillies red, not Kansas City Chief red. What, what is that you got on? I can't see that. Yeah, the Philly, Philly, Philly spring, spring training no. hat, man. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. That, that we like. Uh, yeah. Also does. Uh, Phillies writing as well, but we're here to talk Eagles with you today. Pretty big turnover in the Eagle coaching staff, John. We knew it was coming, knew there was a chance that they were going to get poached for their top uh, coordinators for head coaching positions. And it filled those two roles, one with an advancement within their own staff and one from outside, which has had a domino effect. You like where the Eagle coaching staff is right now? I, I think so. I, I think what more than anything else I, I feel about these moves is that I, I trust their process to hire coaches. I, I trust what Jeff Lurie and Howie Roseman do in terms of bringing aboard head coaches. They've had a tremendous amount of success with that. But uh, I think when they have been involved in the assistant coach process, I think we've seen some some good things in recent seasons. I think where they went wrong was with Doug Peterson, some of his selections when, when he was here as far as his coaching staff is concerned. And you can argue whether or not a head coach should be allowed to have autonomy over his coaching staff. But I do think the way the Eagles put the interview processes together really filters out a lot of guys who they know aren't going to be a good fit for them and allows them to target the guys who are going to be a good fit. And so they know Brian Johnson really well. He was going to get an offensive coordinator job someplace else this offseason probably or next offseason if they didn't go ahead and promote him here. The work that he did along with the rest of the coaching staff, but to turn Jalen Hurts into the player that he's become, certainly he's deserving of this promotion. And we have to see how he does as a play caller. It's a totally different skill set, but he's he does have some experience at lower levels doing that. So I like Brian Johnson. He seems like a really smart up and comer. And we don't know a whole lot about Sean Desai as a defensive coordinator. He's only had one season under his belt as a DC, but everything you hear is that he's in the same line as, as Vic Fangio. I'm a little bit less enamored with, with somebody like that. If only because maybe Jonathan Gannon has left a sour taste in, in many of our mouths and we are associating a Vic Fangio style defense with a Jonathan Gannon style defense. And I think we have to remember there are lots of shades of gray with regards to defense and defensive coordinators and the talent that he's going to have at his disposal is going to be different than what Jonathan Gannon had. So I'm kind of more wait and see about Sean Desai, but also trusting the Eagles process and bringing these guys on here a little bit. I think they've earned that. Yeah. It's kind of like when people dismiss Ohio state quarterbacks because, Oh, sir. So 20 years ago is from Ohio state. He didn't work right. out, but yeah, I don't like when people just assume a coach is going to be a bad coach because he's running the same scheme or philosophy as, the previous coach who by the way was a pretty good coach but we we will agree to disagree on that one yeah the political ramifications of it though john that's my concern because i'm sure you saw marcus hayes's report and art wilson um don't know if it was his camp but some people think he was fired um other people say 
the Eagles uh, say it was mutual. I kind of knew when they passed over to Denard Wilson, he wasn't going to stay. So, mm-hmm. however, however, it shook out is not even the most important part to me. The fact that it creates these ripples and I don't know if you want to call it controversy, whatever adjective you want to use. When you have these changes, that was one of the biggest strengths of the 2022 Eagles, in my estimation, John, continuity on the coaching staff. Now, for better or for worse, they've lost five. Mm -hmm. There's not going to be that continuity. Any concern over that? Yeah, there's there's definitely concern over that. I think more on the defensive side than the offensive side. Uh, promoting Brian Johnson in house does allow Jalen Hurts, especially, to have a level of comfortability with what what's been going on there the last couple of years. And really, Nick Sirianni is the guy who is the guiding force behind what they're going to do offensively. He may not call the plays, but he's putting together the game plan. So I don't think I'm not concerned from an offensive standpoint because most of the players will be the same. And most of the, most of the coaches will be the same on the defensive side. They are at a crossroads. It's going to be a very interesting 2023 because we don't, we have no idea who the starters are going to be next year at so many different positions. What, what the player situation is going to, is going to look like with free agency and the draft you've got, they're going to have to start relying on younger players more with Jalen hurts, getting his contract this off season, we assume. And so, yeah, you bring in a new defensive coordinator and you ruffle some feathers maybe with some of the, the coaches that were here before and some other guys who have left and, um, certainly some of the players have their favorites as well. And if those guys are out the door or they feel they've been mistreated or mishandled in some way, it will, it will cause a little bit of a friction there, I think. But when it comes down to it, I think when, when the season starts, these guys all play for each other and they want to get back to the Super Bowl. It, I think the only way it really causes a big problem is if there's a communication issue between the coaches themselves and getting that message down to the players. And we'll just have to see how that works out. It's one of those things you can worry about. It's not, it's not really anything you can do anything about right now, though. I, I need a little bit of a coaching prediction from you. Um, Brian Johnson's got two years NFL coaching experience. Not a lot. College previous, but only two years in the NFL. And none as a play caller in the National Football League. But he's got a great relationship with Jalen Hurts, which sure as hell is going to help. Well, he'll be calling plays for the Eagles all year long. Or is there a chance at some point the head coach steps in and goes, hey, I gave it up. I can take it back. I think Sirianni really likes not having to call the plays. I do think Brian Johnson will be the play caller the whole season. Uh, I I don't anticipate that. Now that they've all been established there for a couple of years, I think they know what they want to do. And so I don't – when they were first getting started, I think part of the problem was they didn't really know what they had in Jalen Hurts. And Jalen Hurts' game was so unrefined at the time, he really <laughs> couldn't throw the ball effectively. He, they, they couldn't really access that part of his game. And I don't know that Nick Sirianni really knew what to do there. Shane Steichen seemed to have a good handle on how to transform the offense. Now they know that, well, what they have in Jalen Hurts. They have a guy who can throw the ball and run the ball. So I think they have an identity on offense now where I'm not as concerned about Brian Johnson coming in and totally messing up the play calling. Um, there may be situations where he needs a little bit of help and maybe Nick does jump in. Maybe there's another guy on the staff who, (laughs) who helps call play calls. If Brian Johnson does struggle with play calling, I don't think it's going to go back to Nick Sirianni. My guess is, uh, one of the other coaches will, will step up. The passing game coordinator will step up and, and call plays. And maybe it's just temporarily for a game or two to get a different voice in there. But I think Nick is very happy with the job, with, with how he has things lined up now in terms of responsibilities. And I don't think he wants that responsibility anymore. Um, Do you think we're kind of under, and I thought, because I have a lot of respect for Shane Steichen after watching him, after getting to talk to him, I think he had a, a, a real feel for play calling. I, I mm-hmm. think there's a sort of, uh, some guys are good at it. Some guys aren't, some guys have it. Some guys don't. Um, yeah. And the assumption not that Brian isn't going to have it, but I think the assumption that he is going to have it is is a pretty big one. Um, you know, he might even be better. I mean, that's a, a potential as well. But do you think people are kind of overlooking Shane Steichen's effectiveness because, oh, we got five Pro Bowl offensive linemen, uh, mm-hmm. A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, Dallas Goddard, Jalen Hurts. 
Miles Sanders is probably going to be gone, but that's it. Um, yeah, that's a lot of talent, but he was a big part of it as well. You think people are underestimating that at all? I might be guilty of that too. Yeah, I, I think that's possible. Uh, he, he's great. I mean, he and there's a reason somebody snapped him up and waited until after the Super Bowl was over to to go out and get him. I think he's going to be great with the Colts. He does seem to have its, you know, you like you said, there's a real rhythm to play calling and to be three or four steps ahead of what the defense thinks that you're going to be doing and using plays in the first quarter to set up plays in the third quarter and plays that you're going to call two or three games into the future to have that kind of chess match playing in your head at all times. That's difficult. And there's not a lot of guys who are able to do that effectively. Like you said, we don't know if Brian Johnson has that ability. We know Shane Steichen did. He was, he was an outstanding play caller. And, and we saw, even with all the talent that you just talked about, John, when in those few instances, when the play calling was not its best this year, the offense did struggle. Play calling is important. You can have all these great players out there making plays, but if the play calling is not doing your players any favors, if the coaching staff is not putting them in a position to succeed, then even the best teams with the best offensive players are going to struggle to score points. So I do think we're underestimating that a little bit. I'm probably underestimating that a little bit. And I'm, I think, optimistic, but it's, it's a hopeful optimism that Brian Johnson or somebody else on the offensive staff will be able to call plays at least as well as Shane Steichen did. And that may be too much to ask considering Shane was so good at it. And I like your might not be Sirianni, but could be Kevin Petullo. Look at it. Mm -hmm. That Shane is bought it that uh, Nick is bought into the CEO aspect of coaching. So if they do need a helping hand, it might come from someone else on the staff. You might be right about that. All right. Let's see if you're right about this one. Need the crystal ball out again. We're only four days away from what should be a major decision for the Philadelphia Eagles. And that is whether Jason Kelsey's going to play for him again this upcoming season. He's kind of on record at saying he's not going to make the Eagles worry about it, sweat, that he's going to free agency. Isaac say, Malo, if they don't keep Kelsey, then maybe they work hard to have uh, Isaac in place. And if Kelsey decides to retire, that starts Monday early. Mm-hmm. So we're talking about Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That's only four days left before Jason Kelsey's going to tell us whether he's going to be back or not. Are we going to know? Is it going to leak out or are we going to have to like speculate on this? And what do you think (laughs) the word's going to be? I think Jason Kelsey will announce something on his social media, on his Instagram. I think it's what he did last year, right? And and that's how he announced it, or at least that's how he teased it. I think we'll see something like that coming up here in the next few days. I, and I do think he'll be back. He did not seem like a guy who was playing his final games in, in an Eagles uniform during the course of the playoff run and, and the Super Bowl. Play, he's as effective as ever. I think a couple of seasons ago when he was really seriously contemplating retirement, he was dealing with a lot more injuries than maybe he has the last year or two. He's been obviously anytime you're a, a mid 30s center in the NFL you're going to be banged up and and there's no getting around that everybody is and I'm mm-hmm. sure he is dealing with things here at the end of the season and it gets harder as you get older to get past them and get get over them that being said it seemed like he was having so much fun this year playing with Jalen Hurts and playing in this offense and playing for a Super Bowl contender and my guess is that getting so close this year within one play, one defensive stop, one turnover, one one yeah. strip sack away from, from winning a second Super Bowl, losing to his brother in the Super Bowl, and certainly the possibility there that he could play his brother again in another Super Bowl this year or, or the next year. It doesn't seem to me like he is – that he's – in any way going to re- considering retirement. I, I, I would be, I would be shocked if he retires. I'll put it. That I'm, way. I'm with you, John. I've changed. I've completely done a 180 on this. I think he's coming back to play. The NFL is going to give out their scripts early. It's going to be Kelsey bold too. Uh, <laughs> you got to yeah. pump up the hits of the new heights podcast. He's got that to do. Right. Um, yeah. I think he's coming back. I'm with you a hundred percent, but there's a bunch of guys who aren't coming back. Um, you were in the green room. You might have heard I mentioned Adam Schefter talking about numbers with Javon Hargrave, 20, 20 million potentially, mm-hmm. CJ, 14 million, 13, 14. We kind of know James Bradbury's not going to be back. If they lost all three of those players, how disappointed would you be? How upset? How scared, if that's the adjective you, you want to use? Um yeah. How, how big of a hit is would that be? 
I would be surprised and I would be, I don't know if I'd be mad um, because it would depend on what they're going to do to replace those guys. And really that's, that's the whole story here is if they, if they don't bring any of those three guys back, Hargrave or Bradbury or CJ GJ, then what are you doing to replace them? The it's pretty clear the 2022 draft picks have to step up this year. They Jordan Davis has to start and play really well. Uh, Nicobe Dean has to start and play really well at one of the linebacker spots. And Cam Jurgens has to step in at guard for Isaac Sayamalo, right? And and so you got to get something out of out of that draft capital. We, we also have to get something, I think, from the rookies that we're going to draft this year, too. The Eagles really got no production from any rookies in 2022. The undrafted rookie, Reed Blankenship, is the only guy who really made significant contributions. Jordan Davis was hurt most of the year. So you're going to have to get some some improvement from some of these young draftees. But I do think they need to bring at least one of those three guys back. I, I would be disappointed if they don't get one of those three guys back in here. I think they, I think Howie is good enough with the cap to make something like that work. But at the end of the day, I think they got to bring one of those three guys back. And each one of those guys has, has positives to bringing them back and negatives to, to, to bringing them back reasons to do it and reasons not to do it. And that's a, a calculation. Howie's got to look and see who can I maybe get in trade. If I lose one of these guys in free agency, are there other free agents who are, who are not quite as expensive? And the other thing that I'm, I'm thinking of with these free agents is, I don't want to pay for past performance, right? I, 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 my concern with, with re-signing Hargrave to a three-year deal, signing Bradbury to a three- or a four-year deal is, are you paying for the past performance or are you paying for what you're going to get from these guys as they age into their 30s? And for, for a team that has a Super Bowl window right now, if you can guarantee me the next, for, for in 2023 and 2024, you're going to get the same players, I, I would be happy to give those guys free agent contracts. But at their stages, at their ages, it's a question mark as to whether or not you're paying for past performance or whether you're going to get that kind of performance in the future. Um, Grant Calcaterra just texted me and said he'd be glad to send you the highlight package of his five catches this year since <laughs> yeah. said the Eagle rookies did nothing. I hope he's uh, on speed dial, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, tied to the question that John just asked you, the Eagles and the price of their free agents and the like. And uh, I think I know you well stolen this enough that uh, you're, you'll be on the same page with John and I here. John and I both fight back against those who say, oh, Jalen Hurts got to give the Eagles a hometown discount. He's got to yeah. take less because he can put better players around him. He's got to give out. And John and I just roll our eyes and uh, shake our heads when we hear that. Here's my question for you. How come nobody ever says that about any of the other Eagle free agents? Why, why shouldn't they all get together all for one, one for all, hands in the middle? Let's do this for the town. Let's do this for the team. We'll all take a haircut. We'll all play for less. Money. No, only the quarterback is the one who's expected to take less than everybody else. Why isn't Javon Hargrave, if, if Adam Schefter says 20, why doesn't Javon just take 15 and give Howie Roseman five to play with somewhere else? Why are, I know they're the biggest earners, mm -hmm. but why are they expected to hold the team up and take less in their own pocket when nobody else gets mentioned in that vein? That's a great point. And if anybody's making that argument about Jalen Hurts, they should also be making that argument about Hargrave and Bradbury and every if they if they're if they are truly leaders, right? That's what we're hearing about Jalen Hurts. If you're if you're a real leader, and, and I did a whole thing on this on the Eye on the Enemy podcast last week, because this made me mad when, when this narrative started started going around. If, if the implication, if Jalen Hurts doesn't go outside the structure of NFL contracts that has been in place and, and is in place for everyone and go to Howie Roseman and say, I'm going to take less money than Daniel Jones. Right. This is basically what people are arguing. <laughs> we want Jalen Hurts to do if I if he doesn't voluntarily go in there and say, I want to do this for the betterment of the team. The implication then is that Jalen Hurts is not a team first guy. Right. So if you're not a team first guy, then what are you? You're a me first guy. And and that's going to be the the that's going to be what's hung around Jalen Hurts' neck if people if he doesn't go in and voluntarily do that it's an unfair expectation it's an unreasonable expectation it's not fair and people should stop it because you're right no one else on the team is being held to that standard and I don't care if quarterbacks make up 25 percent of the cap overall they're that good and the work <clears> that Jalen Hurts put into this to make himself the player that he is he's earned whatever the fair market value for him tells him he should make 
they, it should not be expected of him to do that. If he if he volunteer, voluntarily goes in and says to Howie Roseman, here's what I want to help you out, I'm not going to, you know, great. But that should not be an expectation placed on him or any other player on the Eagles. No, I think the NFLPA might implode if that they happened, would. John. Yeah. Uh, exactly yeah, right. They would be uh, very upset. No, it's ludicrous, especially for, you know, maybe on the fifth contract, if he gets to that point, Tom Brady level, you take a right. few left spots, maybe, uh, but certainly not. Uh, on your second contract when you made a little over a million dollars last year and gave the Eagles about, I don't know, a hundred million <laughs> value. <laughs> so right. the Eagles are still going to be ahead of the game. And one of the things I like about Howie, he explained it, you know, the only better thing uh, than not having to pay the, your quarterback is wanting to pay your quarterback because that means he's, he's really, really good. So, I'm with you. People should stop saying that about Jalen Hurts. It is unfair. It's also unrealistic, the more important point. So stop talking about it. It's unrealistic. Right. right. It's not happening. Yeah, uh, exactly. So when we talk about this team, however, and, and, and moving forward offensively, one of the big things is always running back. We get to this point of the season. Is how are we going to take a running back? B. John Robinson is so explosive. I had Daniel – Daniel Jeremiah had his conference call and he said, boy, if you could put Bijan with AJ and Devonte and Dallas Goddard and that offensive line, how good would it be? You know, Derrick Henry is potentially on the trade market. You know, Eagles fans, John, big name, big name. <laughs> Give him to me. Um, does anybody notice one of the great things about the Eagles running game? Yeah, great offensive line, but it's the plus one aspect of the running game, what Jalen Hurts brings to the running game. Why in the world would you want to bring an eye back in and say, yeah. oh, just hand it off, just <laughs> hand it off. <laughs> then you're taking the plus one out of the offense, the RPO, the zone read. Anybody realize that? Why is everyone so obsessed with turning the clock back to 1975? And I want a running, I running back. Yeah, I think the eye running back is is no longer a thing in in football. There are only a couple of guys and a couple of teams that that do that. And I think for those teams that have those types of guys, you have quarterbacks who are kind of mid, right? I mean, yeah. you, you have these guys who are not star quarterbacks. They're they're not like Jalen Hurts, and so you need that running back to to carry the load for you. And that's not the situation with the Eagles. I, I love the idea of Bijan Robinson. I I think if he's there late in the first round, if you decide to keep your number thirty pick or thirty, what is it, thirty one pick? whatever it is that that late first round pick, if he's there and he's fallen that far, I think that's a good value pick at that point. And I would consider that. I, I'm not saying I would definitely pull the trigger. It kind of depends what else is there, what the Eagles needs are. I think if the Eagles had less needs on defense, if they weren't losing so many guys and they had more stability on the defensive side of the football, I could see taking Bijan early in the draft. I could see it. You could make an argument for a team that's in a Super Bowl window right now for a team that maybe doesn't want their quarterback to run quite as much and open himself up to injury quite as much as Jalen Hurts might over these next couple of years. I think you can you can make an argument that that having a guy like Bijan Robinson makes some sense. I don't like the idea of a Derrick Henry because he's so much older and he's got so many, you know, he's got so many much more miles on the tires, but at the end of the day, given where the Eagles are, what they need on defense, how they need to kind of fill some fill some holes and get some depth, especially on the defensive side of things, and get some replacement, um, some future re replacement folks like on the offensive line to replace uh, Lane Johnson in a couple of years. I think you need to be thinking about the draft in in those terms and and not necessarily using a high value pick for a running back. I think there's some ways in which it makes sense, but at the end of the day, it's not what the Eagles do offensively, and I don't. I can't envision Howie Roseman taking a running back that high. Oh, by the way, John, you mentioned uh, the, the Jalen Hurts should take less than Daniel Jones. Did you see what Jan Daniel Jones said yesterday? He gave the Giants a team-friendly deal <laughs> so they could build around it. $82 million yeah. guaranteed in the first two years of the deal. But that was a team-friendly team deal. Team-friendly. And by the way, he's right. It is a team-friendly deal. That's he's the going Daniel rate. Jones. That's yeah. the going We're rate. not talking about Aaron Rodgers here. It's Daniel Jones, $82 million guaranteed in the first two years. How is that team-friendly? 
I mean, did I've, Daniel Jones play this beautifully? He stunk for the first four years of his career. He gets, and then in his walk year, when they when they when they turned down the fifth year rookie rookie deal, he gets a great offensive coach. He has his best season, which still wasn't awesome, by the way, but no, was, was certainly his best. And and put the Giants in a position where they had to pay him. It's it but really that's is where beautiful. It, guys, you know, Joe Banner was on Rich Eisen's show, and he was giving Jalen Hurts advice as Joe was wont to do. Uh, he likes to give everybody advice, but he recommended wait, 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 wait. Because if Joe Burrow goes, if Justin Herbert goes, it's only going to go up and up and up and up and up. So, yeah, Daniel Jones is the going rate for Daniel Jones level of quarterback. And that means Jalen Hurts is going way over 50 million. Yeah, and uh, I've heard I've had some people say to me too. I'm not ready to give Jalen Hurts the big contract yet. Yeah, you know I need to see one more year. Well, if that if if that's your plan, you're losing him first of all, and second of all, you better be looking at that number ten pick for a quarterback. So that's not happening, right? I mean, no, he's getting no. paid and he's going to well, get a market here, value. Here's how it can happen, Sean. It it would be Jalen's decision. In other sure. words, he'd be taking Joe Banner's advice and waiting. It would be his decision. Yeah. Um, and he might, you know, say, go the Lamar Jackson route and say, I want to get every dime I can get, but I don't see Jalen doing that. But if, if it does happen, the Eagles still have the final year on his rookie deal. They still have the franchise tag, which they don't mm -hmm. like to use, but they would obviously use it on him. Yeah. Um, so they still have all the leverage from an aspect of they're not going to lose them, at least for the next three years. Um, it would, that would be Jalen's decision. That's the only way that could happen in my estimation. Yeah. And I agree with that. But the fact that they do, they do technically control him for three years. That's a little leverage on the Eagles side too. I mean, yeah. I don't know that oh, that comes oh, yeah. up in negotiations, but maybe it does, you know, like it's a, you know, you know, we do have him under control franchise tag and all that. So it behooves both sides to get something done. I think sooner rather than later. And by the way, Daniel Jones, one and six in the division this year. Well, yeah. oh, that's a team friendly. But he had a good playoff it, game against the worst pass million. defense in the NFL. He played two playoff games here this year. Yes. One good and an ass kicking by the Philadelphia Eagles again mm. this year. So I got it. I'm sorry. I just cannot buy team friendly deal from Daniel Jones. I uh we've been debating this now for a couple weeks since how we went there in the combine. I need your take on it, John. How he admitted that he went away from his usual modus operandi this year, that in season, he knew how, how many guys he had coming up on free agency. They usually like to get a deal done ahead of time, identify core players, get something negotiated before they get to free agency and keep a piece or two in, in their core. He did none this year. Mm -hmm. And he said it was because they decided to get none done this year because they were off to such a good start and they didn't want to try and identify, well, which of the eight, nine, 10, 11 guys do we want to try and do? Do we not want to try? And, and he felt that he could screw up the uh, mojo in the clubhouse and the vibe with the team. They went to the Super Bowl and had, it was tied with 10 seconds to go. So that's a hell of a season. Mm -hmm. So if you believe not doing it gave you that much more impetus to have a really good season, but one that didn't end in a championship, we still have the free agency period to see who we can resign, who he loses, and the like. Did Howie Roseman handle it correctly in season when he decided we're not going to do it the way we usually do it? I think so. I think they recognized they had something really special going on. I do think, especially in football, the clubhouse, uh, the clubhouse, the locker room is how you really, um, it, it is a really big deal how those guys get to get along together and, I don't know how much it would have affected their play on the field if, say, Hargrave gets an extension and Bradbury doesn't or Bradbury gets an extension and CJ, GJ doesn't or whatever. But, you know, at the end of the day, they didn't they didn't want to upset the apple cart. And I think the process trumps the results in this case. I mean, like you said, they were 10 seconds away, one play away, one stop away from being world champions. And uh, if that happens, then unquestionably it was the right decision. Uh, so I think if I'm going to, if I'm going to say unquestionably it was the right decision, if they won the Super Bowl, then I got to say it was the right decision 
losing the way they lost and even getting there because the whole goal is to get to the Super Bowl. It's really hard to, to win that final game as we as we saw this year and as we've seen with other Eagles appearances in Super Bowls. Even the one they won was was was, was like pulling teeth. So yeah. at the end of the day, I think Howie Roseman did the safe thing. I think he did the right thing. And like you said, there's still opportunities to sign these guys. You can right. still sign them. It's going to cost you a little bit more probably now. But, you know, the window of opportunity to sign who you want isn't closed. And so I think I think it was the right move. Yeah. And I think kind of like uh, Daniel Jones spinning his contract is team friendly. Howie spun that a little bit because – He's right. I agreed with him, John. It's like you don't want to upset the apple cart in the locker room. But also, he didn't have any stinking leverage. Everybody was having a right. career year. Yeah. So <laughs> it was going to be difficult. You're going to have to overpay guys, and he doesn't want to overpay guys. So that was yeah. part of it as well. At John Stolness, make sure you follow John on Twitter, especially, you know, Phillies are getting ready to – uh, ramp up in spring training. You just let that slip out. Clubhouse. John's got yeah. Phillies on the mind, baby. <laughs> Reigning National League champions. Yeah. Um, maybe we can get breaking news here. Stoneless, do you know what the hell is wrong with Andrew Painter's uh, elbow? Because yeah. no, no one I, seems to know. It's the it's the be best kept secret since uh, World War II, I would think. The only thing I can think of is they're trying to figure out how to use a 3D printer to make them a new one. I mean, I don't understand <laughs> no. what's going on with it. It makes no sense. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned past performance. We'll end it here with the Eagles. Um, you don't want to pay for past performance. One of the things, and how he's admitted, he likes his guys, man. Yeah. You want to pay for the past performance of Brandon Graham and Bletcher Cox and bring him back. I think for Brandon Graham, yes, because I think the number will be low enough that you're not expecting him to be a starter. You're expecting him to continue to provide the depth uh, that he did last year. And what has the, been the big complaint about Brandon Graham over the years is that he's a good run stopper. He, he gets to the quarterback, but finishing has been a problem. He just wasn't able to pile up the sacks. Well, this year is the best year he's ever had sacking the quarterback. And I think I think he still has a lot of motor there. I think if you can get him for four or five million dollars, I would absolutely do that. Fletcher Cox, I'm not as enamored in bringing back. But that being said, if you lose Hargrave, I think maybe you need to look at bringing back Fletcher Cox on a one-year deal. And I don't know what number feels right with regard to, to Cox. Um, and I don't know, like, there might be other defensive tackles out there that you could get that would do something similar, maybe for a little less. But I don't think so. Fletcher Cox is... I think he's like the separate the seventh or eighth best defensive tackle in free agency right now. So I, I don't yeah. because they're not going to cost a whole lot because you're not giving you're not giving Fletcher Cox 14 million or whatever what the number was like you did this year. It's, you know, four or five. Right. I mean, is that that's, I that's think that's what, an, that's what that's Howard, what Howard said. said the other Boy, I day. think four is low. Four million dollars. If you get million, him, I'm bringing Fletcher back. Yeah, I, yeah, that's a no brainer to me. If I can get him for yeah. four, I'm like, yeah, please come back. I, and I'm not think, bringing him back for more than that. All right. Man, that's not man, a bad way to look at it. Right, last thing, I, I put this to our guest yesterday and John as well. There's a lot of things that can happen between now and when the Eagles have their first camp, which remember, the first camp of the year is before the draft. We have, you have the one veteran camp, and then you have the rookie camp thereafter. Um, and we'll have a better grasp on it then by who's here and or after the draft for sure. Are you okay with Kenny Gainwell as the lead back of the Philadelphia Eagles in 2023? I think what they need, if Kenny Gainwell is getting the majority of the rushing attempts and he's your, he's, you know, your, your best pass catcher out of the backfield. I think I'm okay with that, but they do need to bring in a bigger running back to help with pass protection and to take some of those carries away. And I would bring back Boston Scott too. I think, I think Scott's for a third running back. Perfect for what this team needs and, and, and what they do. So I, this team doesn't have like a primary ball carrier. I mean, we saw Miles Sanders have some games this year where he got a lot of carries. He got a lot of yards and then kind of disappeared for, for different, for, for long stretches as well. So I think Kenny Gainwell can get you close to what Miles Sanders gave you this year. I really liked the way his game progressed as the season went along, but I do think you need to bring in someone else. I think you need to bring in a bigger back, whether that's in the draft, whether you go and get somebody, maybe use your second round pick for that. Or I, I think we're going to see how he trade back and, and pick up like an extra fourth round pick or something like yeah. that. And exactly. use a running back in that kind of a situation there. You do need to bring somebody else in. I'm not comfortable giving Kenny Gainwell 20 carries a game every game. 
But I yeah. think if you're giving him 15, you're giving another guy six or seven, <clears throat> and you're giving Boston Scott what he normally gives you, and then you have your Jalen Hurts runs, I think that's your formula. And if that's how they're planning on using him, I'm fine with that. By the way, guys, if I'm Joe Shane, I'm giving Boston Scott just an extra million <laughs> of that Daniel Jones team-friendly savings. <laughs> just, to right. sit him, just so I don't have to deal with him. I don't yeah. even have to play him. Just get him away from my team. That's what that's I next level him. thinking. That's yeah, next level that, thinking. Absolutely. Pretty, pretty damn impressive by you, yeah. uh, Johnny Mac. All right, John Stone is always a pleasure. Uh, check out his Eagles podcast, Eye on the Enemy, and his Phillies podcast as well, where at some point over the next, when every next uh, – uh, posts one, he's going to have the answer to what the hell is wrong with the elbow of the Philly superstar rookie pitcher. Uh, apparently, the only one who knows is Scott Boris, his agent. No one else here in Philadelphia does. Uh, Johnny, we uh, love whatever you come out with us. Thanks for doing it today, big guy. You bet. Thanks, guys. Thanks, John. John Stolness, Bleeding Green Nation here with us on Birds 365. All right, Johnny back, Jody Mack coming back. Uh, next out, we're going to have another good guest. Two good guests today, guys who are always good when they come on. Our pal Chris Landry, former NFL coach, um, scout, uh, still consultant to NFL teams out at the Combine. He'll fill us in a lot on what happened in Indy last week. Uh, but we've still got uh, 20 minutes before we get to him. Mac and Mac coming back next here on Birch 365. Go to get your game on. Go for the beers. Go for the cheers. Go for the hit and the hits. Go for the stakes and the stakes. Go to get your parlay on. Go to get your party on. Go for the scene. Go for the screens. Go for the gallery. Go for the win. Go to Ocean. Visit theoceanac.com to plan your visit. At Pond Lee Hockey, we've recovered billions of dollars for our clients, and we're confident we can do the same for you. With over 250 years of combined courtroom experience, we've helped over 100,000 injured clients obtain some of the largest settlements in Pennsylvania. One conversation is all it takes to help you and your family get back on track. If you've been injured in an accident, give Pond Lee Hockey a call. Hi everybody, my name's Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at Drytech. At DryTech, we offer three major services, the first one being basement waterproofing, the second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs, and then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Jeff D'Ambrosio doesn't need a special event to appreciate his customers. Jeff shows his appreciation to them every day of the year. Jeff makes sure to stock more new inventory than anyone and guarantees prices and payments that nobody can beat. There are so many reasons that thousands of customers know Jeff is the easy, friendly place to do business. More for their trades. No judgment zone for credit issues. The best, most reliable service department in the country. That's why I like Jeff, and I know you will too. Jeff will satisfy you every day. Jeff D'Ambrosio, Destination Downingtown, Owner Appreciation Event. We all know that taxes are just part of life. It's true during our working years, but also in retirement. But what you might not know is up to 85% of your social security benefits might be taxed. Our team at Thrive Financial has helped retire thousands of people across the Delaware Valley by asking questions they never knew they needed to ask, including how their social security benefits might be taxed. It's time to be proactive on taxes. Get your Thrive Retirement Tax Playbook today. Plan your day with confidence. Keep the umbrellas on hand. With action news and AccuWeather. Numerous tornadoes. Your go-to team when severe weather strikes. The water is still rising. Keeping you prepared wherever you watch. Action news and AccuWeather. The team you trust. We're back here on Birds 365. A little slow getting my coffee. Sorry. I apologize for that. Uh, no, it's my of- fault. I, I had the screen down. I would have jumped in. But I, I'm, right. I'm waiting for the music, and I'm waiting for Jody Max. So I'll take the McMullen. I just put the headsets on, heard the music. I said, oh, shoot, get back to work, McDonald. Which, by the way, um, 
I just went upstairs, like I said, to get the coffee and the wife's there and she's like half asleep on the couch. And I said, morning, hon. And she goes, you sure? Uh, she got caught up. Have you ever gotten into a binging mode where it took over your life? No, but I've gotten into a binging mode. Yeah, but I, I, I'm, I'm torn with binging because one, I, I like to do it, but I don't have time to do it. And then when I do do it, I'm like, what the hell am I doing? I should be doing something else. So I'm one of those people. Yeah, see, the last time it happened to me was a good couple of years ago. I never watched Game of Thrones. Never they watched were, it. I'm with you. Still you never watched it. it at all? You nope. never went back? and I'm not oh. a big fantasy guy. I, and Everything's fantasy, but what, it was sci, whatever you want to call it. I, I, I'm not... It's not my cup of tea. It was it was one of the greatest television shows ever made, but I didn't watch it for years. And so many people, you have to watch. You have to. I get tired of listening to it. And uh, the, the one the previous that was twenty four. Um, when twenty four was on with Keeper Sutherland, um, I was determined to watch it every single year. But then I would miss the beginning of it and uh, get two episodes. That's all right. Well, I get it next year and then the next year and then the next year. So one year, this was before I had uh, DVR control here at the house. I would go to the library and get the actual uh, DVRs. Wow. I still had an old school DVR player in the house and watch them. And I finally caught up to a season. I think I had to watch four be all the uh, discs. And then caught up to it, at least with Game of Thrones, it was on demand. So I got to watch them all right at the, in the comfort of my own home. But I did. I lost two days of my life. I just watched episode after episode after episode. I got up. I started watching. I had a meal. I went back to watching. I had another meal. I went back to watching. I went to bed. I got up. I started two days. The last two days, the only thing my wife has done is watch Yellowstone over and over and over and over again. So she goes, yeah, I went to bed at 6 a.m. And she's up now at what time is it? 8.03. Uh, Cause she's got yeah. stuff she's got to do today in the morning, but she's dragging cause she can't turn the damn thing off. You got to yeah. be careful with that stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah. My wife, when we do get into something, should we do one more show? You know, should we go to sleep? Yeah. Um, you know, and then, so I kind of like it and I kind of don't like it. Like when uh, Ted Lasso came back on, on, for last season, they they did it one show at a time. They they released one show a week, like traditional television. And I'm like, well, what the hell is this? <laughs> I'm like looking, where's the next episode? I sat down. I think I'm going to watch it, um, you know, knock out four or five, and hopefully you get it done in a couple of days. And they're doing one show a week, and I don't like that. So it's kind of a give and take. Understood. Uh, yeah, the one that I'm watching that's streaming, but is one to oh, uh, have you watched Poker Face? Uh, I saw it, I haven't watched it. It's on right. Peacock, right? It's on Peacock. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the lead actress is, is she's funny, she's different, she's got a different vibe to her than any other actress I've ever seen. For some reason, yeah, Natasha I, I, Leon, I believe. If, if you got her name, God bless it. I should know it because I, I think she's really good. Um, the show started off good, had a couple of not great episodes. The last one was real good. And Thursday is when they put out their new episodes. I binged to catch up for like the first five episodes, and they're up to about eight or nine now. Um, but I, I will be watching that tonight. That's one of those where I actually do know the date. And uh, even though it's streaming, I will watch it because I do enjoy that show. All right. Our buddy Jimmy Kemsky from uh, Philly Voice, who is, as far as I'm concerned, the king of compensatory pick information, had a column the other day about if the Eagles were to lose all of their free agents, what would they be getting back as far as compensatory picks go? Because, oh, how he sung the praises of compensatory picks. He kind of threw up the flag that said, yeah, we're not getting all of these guys back. We know we're losing some. The question is which and how, who are we going to be able to retain and the like. So uh, Jimmy, who understands, and oh, by the way, you talk about streaming and doing all these things. I can honestly say I do not understand the compensatory pick theorem. <laughs> you have to be able to figure out exactly what 
a player did statistically and how much his salary is in comparison to the other salaries at that position to come up. They've got a formula and a theorem that tells you yeah. exactly what you got. Well, there's only 32 of them, number one. So people have to understand that. He can only get four as one team. You can only have four of those 32. What do you mean by there's 32 of them? There's only 32 compensatory picks. Oh, um, total that will be given total, out in the league. Yes, yes, yes. Sort of like another round of draft picks. Uh, 32 of them. Um, four is the maximum. Now, there's more than 32 compensatory picks. Now, that confuses people, too, because now they give out compensatory picks for, say, Rooney Rule candidates when right. they hire... Uh, so there's more than so that confuses people. So is it 32 plus, or does that factor into the 32? No, it's so you 32 get plus. Player? It's 32 plus. Those other ones are different. So in the category of just losing players in free agency, there's 32, and that number doesn't change. Um, and even if you lose five of the top 32 players, which the Eagles could do this year in theory, you don't get five. You can only get four. So you're limited to four. Um, yeah, so it's confusing. But and, uh, and oh, by the way, and again, I'm readily admitting I don't understand the theorem, but one of the parts I do understand is if you sign a free agent, then that plays against a free agent that yes. you lost. Oh, yeah. If there is a comparable player, salary, production, and the like, let's say the Eagles lose five free agents, but they add two free agents yes. would fall into that compensatory. Well, and they're only going to get three picks. So it isn't just you You, you take the no. top four. Eagles got four. What no. rounds would they be in? Boom, put them that's, in your That's mix one of the most year. frustrating parts of it as a reporter because as soon as you lose a player, and trust me, so I'll use Javon Hargrave as an example. If he signs a big money deal as people expect, I'm going to get, do the Eagles get a compensatory pick for that? Most likely is the answer, yes. But it depends on what they do in free agency. And Howie's very smart with that. That's why he talks about it. He's not going to sign a player that will affect his compensatory pick for Javon Hargrave. Um, so, yeah, most likely you're going to get a third-round compensatory pick if he signs a $20 million deal. But, again, there's a lot of factors that's not – in other words, when he signs his contract, it's not, oh, you get a third round compensatory pick. It depends what happens, not only with what you do, but the rest of the league. Sure. If somebody else out there is getting bigger deals, and it's probably not going to happen. But again, there's 32 throughout the league, and every single contract factors into it. And uh, the numbers that Jimmy speculated on, these are purely speculations. Jimmy's pretty well uh, entrenched, so I, I think he's probably going to get most of these right. He's certainly going to get them all very close. For the Eagles free agents, Hargrave top one. And by the way, the highest compensatory pick can get is the third round. There are yes. no first or second round compensatory pick. That's the creme de la creme would be a third rounder. He thinks Hargrave will get a third. Bradbury either a third or a fourth. Chauncey uh, Gardner-Johnson, a fourth. Isaac Sayamalo, a fourth. Fletcher, he doesn't even think. Now, if he comes in at $4 million, come back to the Eagles of $4 million to anybody else. That's right. He's not going to get you a compensatory pick. Um, he thinks Miles Sanders, and again, the Miles money is one of the more debatable things during this offseason. I, I've heard some people speculate that Miles is going to get good money on the open market, multi-year deal. I'm not sure that that's the case. And I think the couple of franchise tags out there, yes. Do they take um, those players out of landing somewhere else out of the mix? Sure. But they also take those teams out of the mix for Miles Sanders. Miles Sanders not going to the Dallas Cowboys. They franchise Tony Pollard. He's not going to the Raiders because they franchise uh, Josh Jacobs. So I just got the feeling that Miles isn't going to be as highly paid as some other people think, but he put him in as a potential sixth rounder. Um, uh, TJ Edwards, a fifth rounder. And that's another one. I got no idea. Now, TJ, you and I are both TJ guys. 
Uh, I said last year the Eagles should have extended him. They extended him one year. Maybe Howie should have gotten more than that. Uh, but I suggest that before the Eagles did it, you've been singing TJ's praises since last year into this year's camp and all year long. What's TJ's market going to be? Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Uh, and I could see it anywhere from like $7 million to over 10. Uh, it's going to be a pretty wide berth. There's some teams that value linebackers more than others. Let's be honest. And that, so that's one of those positions. Look, did the Cardinals come in and say, all right, we got Jonathan Gannon and Nick Rollis. You know, let's get TJ Edwards to lead our defense. Um, let's pay him $10 million a year. Then I think he's leaving. Um, and, you know, compensatory pick a little bit higher maybe than expected. But, Again, what and I, and I think Jimmy put it at the end. Um, four, that's the limit. You can't go above four. So even if you lose Miles Sanders, and even if you lose T.J. Edwards, and they would have factored in, you're not getting those picks. You you can't go above four. Um, so that's a lot of picks. It usually takes care of itself on a typical year. You're never going to get up to that number. This year, the Eagles could push it. They could push it to where, in theory, they should get five or six compensatory picks, but they can only get four. It doesn't right. go above. And that. and oh, by the way, you get the four top picks after you have the comparison of any free agents you sign. Let's say they lose Fletcher Cox, but they sign a uh, let's stay on the defensive line and a free agent with the same type of production and the same type of salary. Well, then those two negate each other. But for the ones you don't have a matching free agent that you signed to replace, you get your top guys. So you got some of the ones that are down near seven or eight. You're going to have to work a little bit to get to them, which is where I disagree with Kemsky. See if you're with me on this. He had Kaiser White as a potential compensation seventh rounder. Marcus Epps as a potential seventh rounder. Now, those are two starters on defense. So you're speculating at what you think their number is going to be on the free agent market, and that drives it as much as anything else. But he said that he thought that Andre Dillard could be a fifth or a sixth. So he's banking on someone giving Dillard a pretty damn good contract yeah. to step in as a starting left tackle. And Gardner Minshew is a sixth. Gardner's going to get a contract that's going to show that he's going to be given a chance to compete for a starting job in this league. I don't uh, think so. Um value of the position though, Jody. Left tackle's easy, right? I mean, those guys get paid. And even though Andre's probably not going to get paid what he would have if obviously be played, um, somebody's going to give him a pretty decent deal. And we already saw Kaiser White. Kaiser's going to get a similar deal to what he got last year. Marcus Epps, I think, you know, the Eagles are probably going to keep Marcus Epps because I think he's going to be pretty cost effective. Um, it's just even backup quarterbacks, you know, backup quarterbacks, you're talking about five, six million a year because of the cap going up. Um, and you know, if, if Gardner generates that, it's going to be more than an off ball linebacker. So I, I get his thought process, certainly Dillard. That's a no brainer. Um, getting a, a, a potentially a better pick. Than, than Kaiser White or Marcus Epps. Um, Gardner's a little bit more iffy, I would say. But yeah, how many names did you run down there? It was at least seven or eight. Oh, I think eight. Yeah. So, and, again. And one of them is not Fletcher Cox because he speculated Fletcher's number is going to be low enough that he wouldn't even generate a compensatory pick. So Gardner those... Minshew, yes. Andre Dillard, who couldn't get on the field, yes. Uh, but, but not It's all got Cox. to do with the contract. And I want to emphasize again for everybody listening, the Eagles are not getting eight compensatory picks. Uh, four four, four is, the max. is the hard, hard limits. And they probably will get four, to be honest. Yeah, it looks like they're going to have at least that many guys leaving. But again, and, and you got to replace guys. I know the main belief for the Eagles this year is, and three of them are already pretty much set in stone, that their three first-round draft picks from last year that didn't play much this year are going to have every opportunity to step in and start uh, next year. 
uh, and they're going to have their two first round picks, their second round pick, their third round pick. They don't have depth, uh, draft depth as of right now. Can Howie do the Monty Hall thing and move some things around and trade back to add numbers of picks, volume of pick, maybe. Um, but uh, if you're going to get really young, that's sometimes what, what's your favorite uh, uh, Jim Schwartz uh, quote for startup uh, costs, baby. Startup, it sounds to me like the Eagles could be looking at some startup costs this year, Johnny. No, Mack. They are. I mean, they didn't go through them with Jordan Davis. For, well, you know, a little bit Jordan, I think people forgot Jordan before he got hurt was starting to ramp up. So they got some of it out of the way with Jordan Davis. They didn't get any of it out of the way with Nicobe Dean and Cam Jurgens. So um, those are two guys they're penciling in. Um, yeah, there's going to be some startup costs there. Um, and then 10th pick in the draft, 30th. Ultimately, I think if you force me to say it right now, I think they're going to trade out, or try to trade out of 30 and try to get some mid round picks. You know, they don't have any in the fourth, fifth, sixth round right now. Um, but either way, they're not going to go down too far into the second round. Um, so they're going to have young players from the draft this year they need to to get on the field relatively quickly. And it's going to be startup costs with them as well. Startup costs are not something you usually think of for a team that's got Super Bowl aspirations. That if you've got several different guys, one guy, you're throwing one guy in the deep end of the pool, you're going to try and help him out. Okay, that's fine. Eagles will have several guys that you would put into the startup cost category at key positions, more so defense and offense, but you get my drift. They're going to need to go young. And yeah. uh, I've been mean, brought up Milton Williams and Marlon Tui Pelo, too. I mean, they're going to count on them as well. And they're still very young players who haven't played a ton. Milton's played. Uh, I, I, I would take amount. Milton out of the startup cost uh, category. Well, I, I think he's going to, he's going to have a much bigger role than he's used to. I think. Um, oh yeah. I think so. But I think he's played enough that he should be up to speed. And I think he's kind of earned the additional snaps and reps that he's going to get. Cause when he's been put in, he has uh, performed. So uh, I'm a, I'm a Milton Williams fan. All right, uh, we'll take a quickie timeout. Uh, Chris Landry from LandryFootball.com, former NFL coach, scout, college coach, and scout. He still does uh, consulting work for a bunch of NFL teams, so therefore he was out in Indianapolis for the Combine. Um, Eagles are already starting to invite some players in. You got 30 invites between the Combine and the actual draft where you can bring players into your facility and – uh, give them that much more of a uh, By the way, did you see the three players uh, reported what they were, uh, Jody? Uh, so far, three top what do you mean by 30 reported visits. They were. Uh, oh, who offensive, they are? Uh, yeah, yeah offensive two, tackle, two, offensive two offensive tackle, linemen from the same tackle. team, Ohio State. <laughs> yeah, and a, and a big defensive tackle. Shockingly, Eagles are going to bring in three uh, trenches, guys. That's yep. Sowie Rose, Roseman's M.O. But again, crunching numbers. They have right now, what, eight draft picks? They got one extra. They're missing three. They've got two extra. So, no, they've only got. Um, no, they got a, they got two first rounders, a second, a third, and I think two seventh rounders right now. Right. So, so they got one less. They've only got right. six draft picks. But you got 30 guys you can bring in. So you can bring in a whole bunch of guys you're never going to have any chance to pick because you got more visits than you do draft picks. So don't think just because the first three who have been identified are going to be Eagles, although I am a, a big fan of uh, the Ohio State linemen who may or may not even be there by the time they pick at number 10. All right, Jody Mack, Johnny Mack coming back. Chris Landry from LandryFootball.com scheduled to join us here on Birds 365. Go to get your game on. Go for the beers. Go for the cheers. Go for the hit and the hits. Go for the stakes and the stakes. Go to get your parlay on. Go to get your party on. Go for the scene. Go for the screens. Go for the gallery. Go for the win. Go to Ocean. Visit theoceanac.com to plan your visit. 
At Pond Lee Hockey, we've recovered billions of dollars for our clients, and we're confident we can do the same for you. With over 250 years of combined courtroom experience, we've helped over 100,000 injured clients obtain some of the largest settlements in Pennsylvania. One conversation is all it takes to help you and your family get back on track. If you've been injured in an accident, give Pond Lee Hockey a call. Hi, everybody. My name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech, we offer three major services, the first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Jeff D'Ambrosio doesn't need a special event to appreciate his customers. Jeff shows his appreciation to them every day of the year. Jeff makes sure to stock more new inventory than anyone and guarantees prices and payments that nobody can beat. There are so many reasons that thousands of customers know Jeff is the easy, friendly place to do business. More for their trades. No judgment zone for credit issues. The best, most reliable service department in the country. That's why I like Jeff, and I know you will too. Jeff will satisfy you every day. Jeff D'Ambrosio, Destination Downingtown, Owner Appreciation Event. We all know that taxes are just part of life. It's true during our working years, but also in retirement. But what you might not know is up to 85% of your Social Security benefits might be taxed. Our team at Thrive Financial has helped retire thousands of people across the Delaware Valley by asking questions they never knew they needed to ask, including how their Social Security benefits might be taxed. It's time to be proactive on taxes. Get your Thrive Retirement Tax Playbook today. Plan your day with confidence. Keep the umbrellas on hand. With action news and AccuWeather. Numerous tornadoes. Your go-to team when severe weather strikes. The water is still rising. Keeping you prepared wherever you watch. Action news and AccuWeather. The team you trust. Appreciate you streaming in here on Birds 365, McFaul and McDonald, joined by one of our favorite guests. He does a great job breaking down the scouting aspect and player evaluation aspect of the National Football League, uh, former coach, former scout, still consulting for National Football League teams, and uh, the host of his podcast on LandryFootball.com, Chris Landry. CL, how many years you've been going to the Combine? Everyone uh, was involved in starting it, and I ran the combine. Um, 82, we had one. Let's see, we had one in Phoenix. We had one in Tampa. We had one in New Orleans before we settled into Indianapolis. So, uh, yeah, we're trying to figure that out. I lost track of the numbers now. But, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's my 41st draft, so it's right about that time. So it's been that long, believe it or not. They had, um, you know, they had those – we had, we call them, now we called them a combine, but it was like four to six teams at that point. It really all started. I still remember Nolan Cromwell. You guys remember him? Oh, yeah. The Rams. But Rams, yeah. He was an option quarterback at Kansas. God bless him. He had uh, a lot of medical issues and w- ran into him in, in the airport. A few of us did. And he'd bring all these big x ray, you know, these big x ray things you got to bring around. Yeah. He'd be going to the hotel. We said, we, we got to figure out a way to, you know, we, so we had, we got like six teams together and said, look, let's go to a location. Let's get, share all the medicals. And then it kind of worked. It caught on and people said, well, we need to do this for all 32 and all 32 bought in to, um, you know, the national, it's technically the national invitational camp and it's owned by all 32 teams. And that was the reason it started for the medicals only. And then it just kind of grew since we had them there to do other stuff. Yeah, and how how badly do you want to keep it in Indianapolis, Chris? Uh, I, <laughs> well, I yeah, I, here's the thing that people don't realize, and the league has taken it. And look, I I know I'm an old fuddy duddy, but <laughs> it's it's become I think and the NFL Network, its programming, its yeah. marketing, and the fans are in it, and the media, and, and that's fine, and that's good from that standpoint. But the players are there much longer. 
and they do less than when we had them there for like two days. You know, for me, I, I, I get the marketing, I, I get all of that, and I know how important that is. But to get the right information and to get that work done requires a focus that I think it's a lot of too much. Media inter interaction and everything. When I was there, media wasn't allowed. And, yeah. and I was running. And it wasn't anything against the media. It's just it's another distraction. It's another you know, we want them going from this point to that point to to where it's all related to interviews. And it's become a little bit more dog and pony show. And um, as I said, I think we still get a lot out of it. The, if we just got nothing but the medicals, that was it. But for Indy, you know, when I got there, you know, everything is there. I mean, you don't you just walk there and everything is there. So if you put it somewhere else. You know, you got to have a convention hall where you can bring all the MRI machines. And then what if you have to have a special medical test? Well, the Methodist Hospital is just like, you know, two blocks away. And we got the Indy Connection vans that take them there and boom, 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 they're back. It is all the things that people don't see yeah. is what makes Indy important. Uh, the other thing is it's centrally located. You put it in L.A., you put it in Miami, you put it in Seattle, you put I mean, at least Indy is somewhat centralized in the country. So you're coming from Philly, you're coming from L.A., you're coming from Miami. You, it's not everybody has to go, you know, all the way across the country. So we like it there. It's better. It's set. And we're not we don't have time to do anything, but maybe one night go to St. Elmo's and get the shrimp cocktail and the steak. <laughs> Uh, this is not a place to say, well, we're going to go and lie on the beach yeah. and, you know, and we're going to work like most conventions. Yeah, we're going to have meetings in the morning and you go to the beach in the afternoon. We're, we're up. You guys know. You guys been around it, know about it. It, it, it don't matter. We're, we could be in Siberia. We're inside and we're doing this stuff. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. So we, we like it, but we'll see what the league does. Here's a scouting question for you because – and maybe I'm just a cynic. This is something that I came away from the combine in this year. Uh -huh. You know how fast play. You watch the games during the week and uh, you have a clue on certain players that you like and what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are. And then you're going to get a little bit more specific with the drills they do in Indy. And somebody jumps up and does something you, you just didn't expect. That he, he, Wow, he really ran that? He did that number? He put up that number? And I get the feeling myself that it was like uh, cramming for a test that he's put these last four or five weeks leading up to the combine doing the same thing every single day. So that he improved in that area, but will he be able to do it when the season starts next year? Or did he just get that good at that particular uh, drill because he worked on it for five weeks intensely to get better at it? You would think that you could just see the results and watch the player play and go, all right, that's the kind of player he is. Do you now have to guard against that? That guys come prepared specifically to do well in a given test to maybe juice their draft stock a little bit? Oh, sure. I mean, uh, but we've been preparing that for a long time. You guys will remember the first guy, and it was, unfortunately for the Eagles, it's the, the Mike Mamula. Mike Mamula. He was yeah. the first guy that really – got into the preparing for the drills. And so the numbers were great, but the production. So the answer, Jody and John, is, is to me, it's, it's not very difficult. The tape has to match the workout. And 90% of the time it does. It's the 10% of the time it doesn't right. that you have to go back and do work. So and people say, well, the tape is, should be the only thing that matters. no. Because remember, the production in college is the production in college. It, it, even if it's at Georgia and at Alabama, it's still college. And you're projecting the transferable skills. How is it going to project to play in the NFL? So <clears throat> you've got to – the measurables help us go back years and years to see how certain guys with certain traits – developed and played well and if they lack those traits they didn't 
you know, now they're called analytics, but it used to be, you know, trends and, you know, whatever name you want to put on it, it's been done for years, but it's been done from a football standpoint to where, okay, that's great. A guy's very productive. Danny Werfel was as productive a college player as you're going to get. Can he translate to the pro game? You know, um, other guys that are not as productive, maybe a Josh Allen uh, you know, at Wyoming was, was hit or miss, but he translated well. So that's why people will look. The other thing is, you know, uh, you could have a guy like a Will Levis that played most of the year injured. So you got to be careful. Okay, not very productive, didn't play well in big games. Well, neither did Ben Roethlisberger. Is awful against Iowa, and he, you know went on ever obviously a great career. <laughs> so you got to put all of it together, and and you and you can't, you know, and, and this is your point, Joe. You can't sit there, great workout, boom. It's make, but he answers some questions. So if you're you're looking at a player, a receiver that's a speed receiver, he looks quick on film, but then he goes and he doesn't have a good broad jump or vertical jump. That concerns you because is he quick and explosive <clears throat> relative to who he's doing it against? And and is it going to be as explosive? If his game is speed and quickness and he doesn't display it in his workout at the combine or pro day, you got to figure it out because if he's 172 pounds and he runs a great 40, but he can't be real explosive, how is he going to separate? How is he going to go up and get make contested catches? You know, so you, you have to put all of that together. And I also think that you have to look at when a guy doesn't work out, what does it really mean? And the, to me, the biggest thing is you learn about the player, and it takes you back to more information. A quick story, I know I go too long-winded, but, but a quick story is uh, there was a player that came out of Nebraska years ago. <clears throat> he was an offensive guard. And he on film, he played high. His head played high. And, you know, so the initial thing watching him is not a very good athlete. Doesn't bend very well. When he goes to the combine, and we do, you just see the, y'all, the folks on TV we just see a few of the drills. That's not even a tenth of the drills. We do flexibility tests. Well, he tested out very well on all of that. So he's a very good athlete. He bends well, but he doesn't bend well on film. So what's the issue? Well, maybe he's not real bright or whatever. Put him on the board, talk to him. You kind of teach him something and make him go back and, and like go back in front of the class. and Very smart. Something's not adding up here. It's just not making any sense at all. He had a hearing problem. Really? He could hear. He could hear. He just didn't hear as good. He never had a problem, meaning it was never something that they looked into because he could hear. He could communicate it. Problem was, he was played on the left side. He had a right ear problem, which, by the way, my good friend Jeff Fisher did, too. He was born deaf. If you ever saw Jeff kind of turn his head, and that's what he did. And he was a former Eagle assistant. Yeah. This kid wasn't deaf, but it was – so he would naturally – when he'd hear the checks, the line checks, he didn't realize it, but he would kind of like move his ear up and to try to hear the checks oh, in the stadium oh, and the crowd oh, and all that. Oh. So he figured, but well, through this medical test, there, there were things they could do to help the hearing. And I don't know the medical stuff. So that was good. But he had exceptional hearing in the, in the uh, right, in the left ear. So on the right side, he was fine. He was a six round pick. That was Carl Nix. He was the best guard in the league for three years. Uh, yeah. He was part of that Saints with uh, guards with Bushrod. And, and he signed the mega contract with the Buccaneers. The whole point is all of that stuff, all of those things, it led to one thing where you studied it and you try to get answers. It's like a, it's like a puzzle. And you try to put that puzzle together because if it doesn't add up, now that was an extraordinary circumstance. Very unusual. <clears throat> because normally if you got a vision problem, you know, that's easy. A hearing problem, if you can't hear, but if it's, if it's, you know, I, I worked out guys, Nick Saban and I went work out when I was with the Browns, we worked out every defensive back around the country. And there's this kid at Kansas that we liked a lot. And every time we threw the ball in the drills over the, his right shoulder, he was great. Threw it over his left shoulder. He was like a 
you know, a blind dog in a in a in a <laughs> he didn't know where he was. He was legally blind in the left eye. I don't know how they never uncovered that, but you know, so it's a problem, you know. You know, so things like that are very valuable and help a lot of players. You learn they get de- detected for things because it's the most detailed physical. We've had players, a number of them, I mean, I, uh, 50, 100 of them over the years that have had problems, ongoing off sense of potential cancer that was, you know, covered. We, we, that's where you, we determined that Garrison Hurst, he didn't have an ACL in his left knee. He never had a knee injury, never had surgery, just born without an ACL. <laughs> well, you know, well, he could play, he's fine, and he did. But you know doctors will say bone on bone. Yeah. He played four years, he played in high school, he's going to play in the NFL, but he ain't going to play for eight years. Yeah. It's 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 you know it's it's you know it's like you got to go get your tire your brakes you know you know so anyway I, I just I went on and on I apologize but that that's no, a, it, it, I, now those yeah, are great stories great story. those are things you get that are not people don't see it's not about whether a guy ran a four three five or four four two oh that no. Guy, no it's not doesn't matter the guy run four three five the guy runs four five I don't worry about how they run what is their body type when they run are they fast enough. Can they meet a certain metric? Because if you don't meet the metric, then you better have something that can overcome it. You know, Drew Brees was not great because he was short. Drew Brees was great because he could overcome that. That's an exception. You you can't go draft exceptions. You're going to be wrong most of the time. It's like just going on 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 a whim on a stock. You could do it. But I would suggest you don't put your whole life savings on it because you might come up, you know, empty. So I think you just you got to do that and be smart about it and understand all the information. Most don't know how to interpret it and utilize it for how to evaluate a player. That's what it's about. But the, the workouts are important because it's it's it gives an indicator of how a guy is going to be to project to the next level regardless how productive he is in college so that helps and it helps the, the intangibles it's where i was able to convince my people and i think i told you this guy's this story before so i won't go into details but this is where i was convincing my folks that eddie george was the right pick for us not lawrence phillips you yeah know, you, you did tell from, us that he yeah. found out from lawrence phillips the problems that he had and that that was going down a path that was going to be really and and we, that's why we have psychologists that can determine things. They are incredibly accurate. They can ask these goofy questions. That's not us. <laughs> That's not us asking those. I yeah. wouldn't know what to flip asking if you were a tree, what type of tree you'd be. I don't know what that means on anything. <laughs> it is amazing how accurate. They'll come yeah. back with a paragraph on each player and say, this guy's a natural leader. This guy will follow. This guy. Guys, it is amazing how accurate they are. It is amazing what they are. This guy will be really good, but you're going to have to pair him with some guys in the locker room because he's a follower. He'll do everything, yet, but he won't take charge. He, it's, it's amazing how accurate they do it. They ask a million questions, not just those goofy ones. That's why we get them involved because I just want to talk football with them because I'm not a psychologist. Yeah. Yeah. All right, all things in, Chris. Who is the guy? Because I know you had opinions on all the players who showed up out in Indy because you watch as much uh, game action and film work during the year as you do. Who was the one who was the most fitting? When you got a chance to look at specific workouts, any uh, specific advice you got from someone who talks to him ahead of time answering the question, the guy who most fit that you came out of Indy and you said, yeah, he is exactly what I thought he was. And the guy who was nowhere near oh, either, man. either good uh, or bad could go either way, either jump off the page and impress this stuff out of you, or, yo, shoot, man, did I miss out on that? He's not a player at all. Who are the guys who are either the most accurate you had coming in and the least accurate you had uh, going out? Wow, that's tough. Most of the guys, and I call I do call it the 90% rule because it's true. Most, I'd say 90% of the guys are what I thought they were. Um, you know, good or bad. 
Right. So let's try to look and see. Um, I mean, I'm, I'll go with the guys at the top that people may, you know, like a Will Anderson is every bit of what I thought he, he was. B. John Robinson was every bit, did everything and maybe even did it even better catching the ball because he did it more naturally and smoothly than, you know, not, didn't throw a lot to him. Guys that worked out usually help themselves. Because to me, if you don't have a good workout, it doesn't bother me because it's not, it's not normal. But I'm looking at bend and movement. So if you worked out, you did really good. I, I would say I came out of it a little concerned about Jordan Addison. He's a guy that I would reference as case okay, 100. And again, I'm not done with him, so I'm not I'm not cementing it. He's 5'11", 172 pounds, 73 pounds. And he ran the 40 well. He had no explosiveness in any of his explosive numbers. So that's a small guy that lives off of quickness and explosion. And I don't, you know, ran the 40 well, but I got to do more work. Now he's going to have better numbers at USC, but I need to see what, what is that. Because you see him move well, and they scheme him open at USC. But how explosive is he going to be separating in the NFL? I'm not, I'm not making that declaration yet. I'm saying those numbers – made me it kind of stopped me in my tracks and said and i gotta find legs dead or whatever that's the other thing too sometimes they work out so much their legs are dead they come there here's the other thing that they do here's the little trick I, you gotta work through you need to you need to be a little heavy so bryce young's gonna come and he oh, you yeah. could t- he had Guys, it's funny. He had the little chubby face, and you tell he was eating like a son of a <laughs> oh, no, yeah. and and of course he doesn't run. Yeah. So he's like two or two or whatever. He put all that weight. Now, when they run, and the big guys do this a lot, that you know they will lose weight and run, but gain weight and lift, and and you know, and it's like they know the tricks. But it's like I tell these guys, we're gonna convert all the times. I mean, I get it. If you're 205 pounds, you're going to be slower than if you're, you know, 195. You can't let what so I'm going to convert it. You're not tricking. I mean, you think, you, you think you're fooling everybody. You, you, but, but a lot on the public, will, you will hear this. Oh, this guy. But you got to put the numbers together. You can't yeah. just say, well, now he's a four. Well, that's the know. thing. You brought up Mike Mamula, Chris. <laughs> that's obviously a big name here in Philadelphia. I mean, you know, ever since Mike, these guys stopped playing college and they go to these workout mm-hmm. facilities and they and they specifically work out, as you mentioned, for these particular drills. But you guys know that, right? You guys yeah. back there. I mean, they're not working out to play <clears throat> football, which is the weird part. They're working out to do well in these 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 tests so to speak but you guys know that so they're not boring anybody. and they got those scripted answers when you ask them the questions so i don't yeah. answer that i learned yeah. this and we'll do this i've done this with belichick does this and we do this and this is probably no surprise to people but so this is what belichick does typically guy comes in the guy's excited he's going to all these rooms and everybody's just, oh man, great to meet you. How you doing? You enjoying me? And Bill will come and say, "Hi, I'm Bill. Sit down." And he'll have the tape queued up to the worst play this guy's ever played. He says, <laughs> "What the bleep is this? Why in the bleep would I want you on my football?" And he and what he's doing, people say, "Well, that's being a jerk." He kind of is jerky, yeah. but I understand what he's doing. He wants to see the player respond because he's not prepared for that. He wants yeah. to see if he's going to throw his coach under the bus. He wants to know, let's say it's a receiver. You know, he wants to know if the player knew what the coverage was. He didn't know what the coverage was, why he didn't. What, and it tells you a lot. You know, I mean, I had a – there's a player at USC, you know. Uh, he uh, he said, well, that's how we're coached. You know, and you know, darn well, it's not how they're coached because you know the coach, you've been there, you've seen all the players, you as president – you know, so you, you get to see a lot of these things that are interesting. So, yeah, they all go script. So if they're going to go script, you got to go off the script and use the 10, 15 minutes you have with them to get right to what you want. You see how they respond and, and see how they deal with it. Um, 
do you know and how you know how they react you see a little bit of their competitiveness you, you see all of that and you can learn a lot about them you know uh Keyshawn Johnson when we interviewed him I don't know if you guys know but when Keyshawn was a little boy he used to hang around the USC football program and he used to just get pocket change by carrying the guy's bags here or there and Jeff Fisher was um uh, a player back then <laughs> and so you could see Keyshawn's personality Keyshawn came in and we talked and said so yeah I understand you used to carry Jeff's bags Jeff was in there he said yeah he said but in a little while Jeff's gonna be carrying my bags <laughs> so, and you know <laughs> yeah. and that was that you know it's fun and cocky but I mean my point is you you do things that can bring out their personality you can learn a little bit about why um why they are what they are their family and just things like that that are you know that they're probably not rehearsed and just like the workouts is okay i want to see certain things that's going to tell me they're prepared for that but that's where i go back to the tape like when you see a defensive lineman or an offensive lineman people don't understand well what is the use of a broad jump or a vertical jump for an offensive lineman they don't jump up high it's not about how high they jump. That measures explosiveness. That measures bend. If you can bend, you're going to be more explosive. That's your natural knee bender as opposed to a waist bender. A waist bender, is, well, the point is in college, you might be so good that you can maul an opponent. But I got to know whether you're a waist bender or a knee bender. Are you a John Runyon senior, that is, who I drafted, who was stiff as a board, but he was so long and strong yeah. that I knew he can be a right tackle. And, of course, the Eagles signed him and had a great career there. And Or is he going to be, you know, is the guy going to be a natural bender that can be more explosive? So it's not the literal how high do they jump that I give a flip about. It's how high do they jump and how far do they jump that tells me how explosive they are and determines what type of player they could be. It's just like. I don't want to, I mean, guys are not going to be rockets. If we needed to have rocket scientists, man, we'd be a, be slim pickets because, you know, it's not. But I want to know whether a guy can learn and how does he learn. One okay. of the best benders ever is going to have to make a decision this week. That would be Jason Kelsey, who has to Ooh. decide, is he coming back for the Eagles this year or not? But that's a topic for another day. Um, you mentioned the GOAT of coaches, Bill Belichick. He didn't show on you this week. Nor did some of the boy geniuses, McVeigh and Shanahan. What do you say to the coaches who say, yeah, I don't really need to go to Indy anymore? Well, I'm telling you, for the, I'm going to go back to what I said. They would have never missed it. Well, the younger guys weren't around then, but Bill would have never missed it back in the day. It's becoming less and less, you know, can more dog and pony shell. So in some cases, uh, for him, it's, and I mean, I talk to him. It's just, it's, it, he's can look at more film, use that time more wisely. It's just, what do you want to go? And you don't, you don't have as much time to evaluate them. All the medicals you're not involved in, they do that. So if you can't really have a lot of quality time with them and you're going to bring <laughs> certain guys in for a visit, um, I still think it's valuable seeing the guys work out in person. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to remind everybody that every, all the drills are done. In fact, they not only do all the drills, but they take each player and they cut up. So everything that they do from how their body type is to the workout, folks can watch it. So the reason why more and more are doing it is because it's just not as useful as it used to be. And I'm not saying that because I used to run it and I'm saying it was better. In a lot of ways, it's more popular, right? People know what's done and, you know, but, but it's less useful for football people because it's more dog and pony show. That's why some of those guys leave. And then the other thing that is really have gotten to it is, I don't know if people wear this, but it's, it's really a convention. Yeah. The NFL oh, yeah. has a convention. The doctors have their convention. The video directors have their convention. The equipment guys have their convention. The strength coach has their convention. So it's also where you begin to, because all the agents are there, the executives are there. They, there's some executives that go there and they don't even see a workout. They're not even, you know, they're not even involved in that. They're meeting with agents to kind of begin do a deal for a guy on their team or quote unquote, you know, over a couple of drinks, 
quote unquote began the yeah the we got a legal tampering process, so we'll just call Indy the preliminary to the legal tampering process. Wink, yeah. wink, you know, yeah. air quotes. That, Saint Elmo's, you mentioned, yeah, that's, down that's there. more of the stuff going. Yeah, you get you get the uh, you get that. Uh, that uh, hot heart sauce with the with the shrimp yeah. and, and you, you put that down Start, their throat and uh, you try to but yeah so that's kind of what it's not as useful as it was anymore to be quite honest with you all right last one from me chris at landry football on twitter landryfootball.com obviously tremendous stories always love having chris uh talk about all his experience with the nfl um you mentioned it a little bit with uh bryce young uh, size Addison. <clears throat> it, it seems like guys are a little bit more open minded when it comes to, you know, you mentioned Drew Brees before. He's not successful because he's small. He overcomes it. You know, you got that kid from Pitt. We got Devontae Smith here in Philadelphia. Yes. He shouldn't be what he is at 166 pounds, but he's a damn good football player. He shouldn't be, maybe. Are guys more open minded to the Clancy's and Cancy's of the world, the Pitt kid, the the Addison's of the world, the Bryce Young's of the world, because we've had these outliers that have had success. Well, I think what's happened, so let's just take the quarterback position. They're more athletic. So pocket guys, you know, you're not going to live if you're a slow guy in your 5'10", 5'11". I mean, where do you go? But you're an athletic guy. That's what they're running in high school. It's what they're running in college. So the athletic guys can move. So what they're open to is the creative athletic, athletic qualities that a quarterback can bring and receivers. So like Jordan Addison is going to make it and he's going to be a high guy because I think his workout, his explosive numbers were a little bit of an outlier. But again, we'll, we'll see. But let's just say it's not. You've got you're playing with three wide receivers starting now, basically, sometimes four. So you, you don't have to play the X uh, or the Z. You know, you, you can be a slot. You can do things. So all this does is, so yes to your answer, but you've got more open spots. You situational substitution. So so you got a defensive lineman that can't play the run very well. He's explosive. You can't teach that. I'm going to use him as a one gap. I'm going to reduce him inside, play tackle and nickel, in my NASCAR package or whatever you call that. And then he'll get a little stronger and maybe he'll be a little bit more of an every down guy, but you live in nickel. You're playing a lot of that becomes more valuable. Okay. You got a guy that's not real athletic, but really good against the run. Well, he's valuable, but he's not valuable as a three down player. Situational substitution, maximum spots in, you know, it's not just, I don't call them wide receivers. I call them receivers because they're, Outside guys, they're inside guys, they're big slot, they're small slots, they're tight end that are type tight, you know. So you got more arrangement of guys that can do multiple things. So, yes, you're open to it. You can live with the guy, Devontae Smith. You not only can live with him, you thrive with him because he's super explosive. He's got versatility, um, you know, absolutely. Now, if you got – if you want to go get the big receiver – that's 6'3", 220, and can run. Well, he's not going to be as explosive. not going to have the same change of direction. Uh, you know, you, you look at an Anthony Richardson. He's got 13 starts. I mean, we don't even know. He can play court. I mean, he's just – he's so raw. But are you kidding me? He's the same size as the Notre Dame tight end Michael Mayer, who runs 4'7 yeah. and is really good. This guy, Anthony Richardson, at the same height and weight, runs – under 4-4. I mean, now, you look at the athlete, we look at Lamar Jackson and what they're doing. So people are saying, hmm, on a rookie contract in a quarterback needy league, do I take a chance and maybe I've got four years or five if I pick up the option to see if I can develop in This guy may be great. He might not develop into much of anything. You know what? It's so important that – Am I going to take a top 10 pick, top five pick? And if it doesn't work out, I'll go draft another quarterback. I, I think that's where things are going because the athletic traits at certain positions that quarterback wasn't – athletic traits wasn't a big issue. Josh Allen, Justin Herbert, 
um, Patrick Mahomes, it's changed a lot of what people can do. You still got your Joe Burrow types. Um, Bryce Young is a different situation because you wonder, great player. You got no questions about him being successful. The question is durability. Is he another Tua? Now, he's actually better than Tua. He's brighter, and he sees the field better, and he's got all. But is his body going to hold up? Is his lower body going to hold I don't know that. History says it's going to be difficult. But it's worth the risk for a quarterback. Can he hold up in today's game? They don't hit him as much. You know, you got to determine whether you want to take him one or two. Or do you think C.J. Stroud has more ability? Those are the decisions that you make. It's not whether this guy's going to make it or Jordan Addison's going to make it. It's like, how high do you take him? Because that mitigates the risk because you've got other options. You can get to. So. We are just seven weeks away from the draft. And Chris Landry, know full well, I'll be texting you again to get you back on as we get a little closer to D-Day. That would be draft day. As always, a pleasure to have you on with us. Love the stories. Continue to tell them to us. Thanks for doing it today. Oh, man, it's always great to be with you guys. You're, you're one of my true favorites of stuff that I do there. You guys do a great job and uh, love the folks in Philly. So always fun. Have a great one. Talk soon, okay? We will get Thanks, you back Chris. on certainly before the draft. That's Chris Landry, LandryFootball.com. Um, and, yeah, he was one of the forerunners of the Combine. So if anybody understands the Combine and the lead-up to the draft, Chris Landry is one of the best in the country to have on to be giving you insight to it. All right, McMullen and McDonald, Mac and Mac coming back to put a bow on the show. Go to get your game on. Go for the beers. Go for the cheers. Go for the hit and the hits. Go for the stakes and the stakes. Go to get your parlay on. Go to get your party on. Go for the scene. Go for the screens. Go for the gallery. Go for the win. Go to Ocean. Visit theoceanac.com to plan your visit. At Pond Lee Hockey, we've recovered billions of dollars for our clients, and we're confident we can do the same for you. With over 250 years of combined courtroom experience, We've helped over 100,000 injured clients obtain some of the largest settlements in Pennsylvania. One conversation is all it takes to help you and your family get back on track. If you've been injured in an accident, give Pond Lee Hockey a call. Hi, everybody. My name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech, we offer three major services, the first one being basement waterproofing, the second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Jeff D'Ambrosio doesn't need a special event to appreciate his customers. Jeff shows his appreciation to them every day of the year. Jeff makes sure to stock more new inventory than anyone and guarantees prices and payments that nobody can beat. There are so many reasons that thousands of customers know Jeff is the easy, friendly place to do business. More for their trades. No judgment zone for credit issues. The best, most reliable service department in the country. That's why I like Jeff, and I know you will too. Jeff will satisfy you every day. Jeff D'Ambrosio, Destination Downingtown, Owner Appreciation Event. We all know that taxes are just part of life. It's true during our working years, but also in retirement. But what you might not know is up to 85% of your Social Security benefits might be taxed. Our team at Thrive Financial has helped retire thousands of people across the Delaware Valley by asking questions they never knew they needed to ask, including how their Social Security benefits might be taxed. It's time to be proactive on taxes. Get your Thrive Retirement Tax Playbook today. Plan your day with confidence. Keep the umbrellas on hand. With action news and AccuWeather. Numerous tornadoes. Your go-to team when severe weather strikes. The water is still rising. Keeping you prepared wherever you watch. Action news and AccuWeather. The team you trust. Running a little late today, which could be no surprise. He's like a library, Chris. Uh, yeah, man. He just keeps going, and 
revealing more information and telling more stories. He's got more stories than a library, as a matter of fact. So Chris, Chris is great whenever we get him on, but he ran a little long today. So we be fresh out of time for you draft next who enjoyed what Chris brought today. Tomorrow, we'll have a guy who doesn't have quite as many stories because he's not near as old as Chris is. Uh, Ian Cummings from uh, ProFootballNetwork.com, their draft analyst, is going to jump in with us. So we'll continue to talk draft just a little bit closer to today's version of the draft than we did uh, with Chris today. Partner, you going to have anything as far as breaking news tomorrow? You think the Eagles? Uh, uh, it's getting coach, close. Or... You know, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe. Get somebody Zach done back. one of their free agents signed maybe. before yeah. we ever get the free agent. You it's probably not going to happen. Anything going to happen? Probably not till the weekend, but you never know. You never know with Howie. Uh, it all happened at 10.05, though, I can tell you that. Uh, well, maybe, hope, hopefully it happens at 10.05 as in five minutes from now. Then you're going to have to wait for 23 plus hours to hear John McMullen and Jody McDonald talk about it. But I'd rather have it and talk about it later than not have it at all. Be back here tomorrow. Johnny Max in, Jody Max in. We'll be back here on Birds 365 in two and two. You've been listening to Birds 365. <laughs> The destination for the passionate Eagles football fan who bleeds green. If it's Eagles football, we're talking about it. Debate inside the locker room and guests that are some of the greatest football minds from around the region. We hope you enjoyed the show. We know we had a blast. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hook up with us on social media at Jacob Sports. See you next time on Birds 365.